All right, so the last speaker of the session, um, and I'm sure that I'm going to pronounce this one correctly because I'm also German, um, is Gabriele Dobelhammer. She's professor and chair of empirical methods in social science and demography at the University of Rostock. Hello, Deutschland. Hello, I, I hope you can hear me. We can hear Do you and see can... your slides, yes. Okay, then I start. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me uh, to give this talk. I will talk about um, trends in dementia incidents and how they are related uh, to the morbidity structure, the multimorbidity structure of Germans. Uh, this is joint research uh, by Vladimir Canudos Romo in uh, Canberra. Annette Erlangsam from the Danish Research Institute for Suicide Prevention and Anne Fink, she's a postdoctoral student at my lab and unfortunately I haven't got a picture from Anne Gloria, she's a PhD student at my lab. So we are doing this together. Um, already 10 years ago, we started at looking at the trends in life expectancy with and without dementia using claims data for Germany. And we developed a multi-state life table um, um, where we included transitions from healthy to demented, healthy to death and demented to death. And we found that there actually was a time trend over a very short period that we could observe. Uh, dementia um, years with dementia depicted here. Uh, so life expectancy with and without dementia depicted here in blue, the one uh, without dementia increased and life expectancy with dementia depicted here in red decreased over this very short period from 2006 uh, to 2009 with uh, um, the two years uh, always in our data. Um, so we had a sort of uh, compression of morbidity with dementia uh, in a case where we have an increase overall in life expectancy. Uh, and when we look deeper into this, then we found that actually in this very short period, men gained 1.9 healthy months because incidence of dementia came down and they lost 0.5 months with dementia also because the incidence of dementia was shifted to higher ages. Women, on the other hand, they gained 1.5 healthy months because the incidence of dementia came down and they lost 1.5 months with dementia because incidence came down and the mortality of women with dementia actually increased over this period. Uh, now, these trends in dementia incidence and dementia mortality somehow reflect what we also know from the international trends. So there is now a general agreement that dementia incidence actually came down um, over the, a time period from the 80s to the 2010s. And uh, there was, a, if, we, if we look at it um, from a meta-analysis, there was a sort of 30% decrease in dementia incidence um, per decade. When we look at dementia mortality, it was not so clear what was happening. So we found that um, we know that generally the mortality of persons with dementia is higher than of those without dementia. But there were studies that show a decline in the dementia mortality over time. But then there are also studies that show an increase in dementia mortality over time. And uh, when we look at life expectancy with dementia, there have actually been only a few studies that looked at life expectancy with dementia. Uh, ours, our study showed a compression of uh, years with dementia over time, and there were also others. Now, let's combine this with trends in multimorbidity. We have heard already a lot now about multimorbidity, and we also know now that multimorbidity is uh, highly associated with um, um, 
dementia, uh, and um, we know that dementia uh, patients have uh, more chronic conditions than people without dementia. So multimorbidity in terms of chronic conditions starts already many years before the first signs of dementia occur. And uh, we know that there is a strong relationship between multimorbidity onset in midlife and subsequent dementia in later life. I mean, that the presentation we had on diabetes is a real good example uh, for that. Now, when we look at the distribution of the number of chronic diseases in the German population, this is actually 67 million individuals uh, insured in Germany, then we see that uh, the number of chronic conditions really increases with age, and we have about seven uh, to eight chronic conditions uh, at ages 75 and above um, among um, the individuals. Now, this leads me to my research question. Um, we have, uh, the question is, is increasing life expectancy associated with fewer years lived with dementia and multimorbidity in the German population? So we have seen, like, there was a, um, years with average life expectancy with dementia was decreasing. Uh, and I'm, we are wondering whether the same trend can be seen in multimorbidity in the German population. So we are breaking this down into three separate questions. How did the dementia incidence and mortality change now between 2006 and 8 and 2016, 2018? So we got a longer time period now. Uh, we asking ourselves, how did these trends translate into average life expectancy lived with dementia? And uh, thirdly, is there a link between changes in dementia incidence and mortality and changes in multimorbidity trajectories? That's the question we would like to answer. We are using claims data from the largest German health insurer, the Allgemeine Ortskrankenkasse, it's called. And we have two random samples of each 250,000 persons, age 50 and above. And uh, we um, uh, we took them uh, in the years 2004 and 2014, and then we followed them up to, up to 2008 for the first period and 2018 for the second period. We define dementia according to the ICD classification. They usually use. The, the usually used uh, numbers from the ICD classification, and we do some internal validation procedure um, to reduce false positive um, classification uh, in our data. We the multimorbidity score. We use the Charlson comorbidity index, excluding dementia, uh, and. Uh, we, in the end, define the nine different uh, health states. Uh, so we have low morbidity, these are zero to one diagnosis, medium morbidity, up to very high morbidity is 11 and above diagnosis. These are all diagnoses excluding dementia. And then we have those dementia with low morbidity, dementia with medium morbidity, and up to dementia with very high morbidity. And finally, we have a state death. Um, with this, uh, let's have a look at our analysis sample. So as I said before, we have two samples, uh, one drawn in 2004 and one drawn in the other one in 2014, with the follow-ups to 2008 and 2018. So after exclusion of incomplete cases, um, and we only started ages 75 and above. We have uh, 63,000 individuals in the first period, 75,000 individuals in the second period, where we calculate incidence rate and mortality death rates. Then we continue uh, and um, um, want to define our health um, the health trajectories and. Uh, 
here we exclude all individuals that were lost uh, to the health insurance. So 1,000 individuals, they changed the health insurance uh, between uh, starting point and end point. And, um, and then we were um, accumulating up the number of uh, diseases they can have over the first two years. So this means we also again lose all individuals that died during the first two years, 2004 and 2005, um, in this, in the first sample, and 2014 and 2015 in the second sample. So in the end, we have then a sample where we do the sequence analysis uh, for our health trajectories. And so we calculated dementia incidence and dementia mortality rate. Then we look, uh, we have a look at the rate ratios uh, over time period, whether we see a change in the rate ratios um, uh, from 2006, 8 to 2016 and 80s. And then we calculate average life expectancy. Now, average life expectancy is a little bit different than life expectancy because average life expectancy is weighted by the number of individuals of dementia at each age x. So we calculate life expectancy at each age and weight it by the number of individuals at, the, at each age. So it reflects better the number of years lived in a population than life expectancy is doing which reflects the number of years lived in a stationary population. But this one reflects the number of years lived in the German population. And then we do sequence analysis uh, with uh, the nine states. Um, we then cluster the sequences uh, into our different clusters and do multinomial logistic regression to see the risk of belonging to a certain cluster by period, sex, and age. And we, I present the probabilities using the marginal effects from this multinomial logistic regressions. OK, let's come to the results. Here, um, I have depicted the dementia incidence at age 75 years and older by period. Um, the dots are the observed. Um, uh, values and uh, the lines are the ones fitted by the binomial um, negative binomial regression. We can already uh, see that there is a decline in the dementia incidence. Uh, and when we put it into the model, then we see that in the year 2016 to 18, the years 2016 to 18, uh, the relative risk is 0 0.93 for men and 0 0.86 for women, and the uh, decline is highly uh, significant. Uh, this change, uh, this relative risk, um, actually, this rate ratio actually translates into an annual change in the dementia incidence of. Um, 0.68% uh, for men and one point, uh, minus 1.41% 1 for women, which is close to what we observed in these international studies of Wu et al. They had 1.3% per year decline in the dementia incidence. Now, when we look at mortality, again, at the rate ratios, we see a decline for men, but we see an increase for women, which is not significant. Um, we, this translates again into a year, yearly change for men of min, minus 1.21% in dementia mortality, uh, and a not significant increase of 0.73% for women. Uh, just to uh, be clear, the total mortality in this population, in the AOCA population, is declining. So this is really an exception and result here for women with dementia that uh, there is dementia mortality increasing. Now, when we translate this now into average life expectancy at age 75, then we see for men the blue, um, the blue part of the table. So average life expectancy with dementia has actually been decreasing. 
uh, increasing, sorry, has actually been increasing from 3.59 years to 4.03 years, and the increase has been significant. Uh, while for women, we see that there is not a change in the number of years lived with dementia. Uh, and just to remind you, so this average life expectancy is a result of the changes in the mortality uh, trend, in the, the mortality rates, uh, the changes in the incidence, and changes in the age distribution of people with dementia. Now, let's come to multimorbidity. When we <clears throat> look at the, the multimorbidity trajectories um, in our data, uh, then we come actually to a nine cluster solution, which reflects our data the best. And here are the nine clusters. Uh, they are from, the, we call them low morbidity cluster, which is 21% uh, of the of our population. Or here the medium morbidity cluster about, this is the most frequent one with 33% of the population. And then we have dementia, for example, dementia with very high morbidity. This is the dark red one. Um, this is only 0.8% of the population. And the last one here, rapid deterioration to death. Gray is the state of death. Uh, so these are the ones that die are really dying fast. So the interesting thing now is, is there a change in the frequency in the, of the, in the probability of belonging to one of these clusters over time? Uh, and that's what we have looked at with the probabilities of belonging to a cluster by period. These are the marginal effects uh, from the multinomial regression. And uh, here on the left, the first one, two, three, four, um, the one to four categories, these are the ones without dementia, the clusters without dementia, and then on the right, the four, these are the clusters with dementia plus the rapid death cluster. And we can see that among those without dementia, we see a decline of uh, low and medium, medium morbidity, and we see an increase in high morbidity and very high morbidity. And now when we look at those who also have dementia, we also see a decline among those who have dementia and medium morbidity, and an increase among those who have dementia and high morbidity, while at the same time, the mortality, the rapid deterioration to death cluster becomes, the, the probability becomes lower over time to fall into this cluster. So we do have a shift from low, medium morbidity to high, very high morbidity, regardless whether you have dementia or not. So when we come to our research questions, the answers, uh, is increasing life expectancy associated with fewer years lived with dementia and multimorbidity in Germany? Uh, no, it's certainly not the case. Um, dementia incidence uh, declined for both case sexes. Uh, we have different trends in dementia mortality for men and women, uh, but these trends translated actually uh, into an increase, into a significant increase of um, years lived with dementia for men and stable years of lived with dementia for women. And the link between changes in dementia incidence and mortality and changes in multimorbidity trajectories, we can say there's a general increase in multimorbidity over time Regardless whether you have dementia or not, it's both, we can see it both in among people with dementia and among people without dementia. So the decline in dementia incidence doesn't seem to be a result of a decline in multimorbidity in old age, or if you want to put it the other way around, it does not lead to less multimorbidity in old age. Okay, limitations. Now, our the um, study is based on claims data, and we always have the issue of the diagnosis uh, of uh, dementia in claims data. How valid is this diagnosis? 
We have the same questions uh, concerning the validity of the diagnosis when it comes to the other diseases that are put in, into the multimorbidity index. Uh, and we also have used the childhood comorbidity index. We could have also used different um, comorbidity indices uh, from three plus chronic diseases or the diseases, for example, that were mentioned in the previous uh, presentations. We have only a short follow-up of the for the multimorbidity trajectories, only three years. Can we observe them? Then is the question of the AOK insurance, uh, because it only covers 30% of the German population, but it covers 50% among the oldest old. Uh, and in general, when it comes to claims data, you always have the problems. There may be changes in diagnosis pattern, the legal framework may change, or regulations of refunding for the uh, medical doctors may change. On the other hand, we have a lot of strengths. We have no recall bias important for people with dementia, uh, no selection, uh, no health selection, because we also have persons uh, living in nursing homes uh, in our <coughs> data, and very important, we also have large numbers at old and very old age where dementia really becomes a big problem. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. Um, Dr. Arnold, there's a question online. You can just All right. take care of that first. Uh, in the chat? Yes. No, it should be in the Q&A section, but that means no questions. We're already answered, is that correct? Yeah, oh, well, it's under like the answer. Your first would answer, exactly. So if you go down, this is the question. Okay. All right, so this is a question for um, Dr. Dormachama. Um, was the average life expectancy calculated as n of ax? Not sure what that means. Um, that is half of the person years lived with by those with dementia. And uh, maybe if the person who want, who asked this question might rephrase that, because I'm, at least to me it's kind of cryptic. Um, Dr. Dovelhammer, was the uh, average life expect uh, average life expect Tensi calculated as half of the person years lived by those with dementia. That is a question. No, the, it was not weighted by the, the, the number of persons who lived with dementia, but those who died from dementia. Probably I have, uh, ex, uh, I have said it wrongly. Uh, so, if it would have been if if it would have been weighted by those who lived with dementia, then it should have been uh, um, half of the person years exposed. Yeah, right. But it was weighted by those dying from dementia. Right. Any other questions? Then I have one. Um, and that one is for Dr. Bishop. Um, so you mentioned that your model tries to account for the fact that um, cognition is not declining in a linear way, um, but accelerating, right? And so my question is, do you also take into account that certain predisposing conditions also affect the trajectory of the, or the slope of the trajectory um, of um, cognitive function in your model? Because I think that's quite an important aspect, right? And I only came across this recently when I looked at these mixed models that are used for um, clinical trials, um, where actually this is one of the major complexities that you have to take into account. Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, so I think in terms of the relationships between the multimorbidity combinations um, and the cognitive trajectories, the estimates of um, regressing the linear slope and the quadratic slope on those combinations and looking at the kind of deviation from the reference group for each of those combinations would give you some indication of how the different disease combinations are related to differences in the shape of the trajectory. Um, but it is limited to a 
you know, a quadratic curvature of the slope. It, it's not something that's like a mixture model where you identify all the potential sub trajectories that exist within that, that uh, trajectory of, of uh, cognition over time. And some of them might be linear, some might be quadratic, some might have other functional forms. It's, it's somewhat different. It's more limiting than that, I'll say. So um, I guess in summary, somewhat, it, it tries to take into account the uh, differences in the shape of these trajectories related to the multimorbidity combinations, but it's not completely flexible in doing so. And what about interactions with um, demographics, for instance? Um, they could certainly be explored, you know, and, and I think that that's a great um, idea. And, you know, I think especially within group, we might, within this group, we might think about uh, um, racial ethnic background as a potential moderator of the association between multimorbidity combinations and these cognitive trajectories. Um, it's not something that I explored in, in this analysis, as it was kind of the preliminary analyses, but I think that that's a great suggestion is to take you know, kind of kind of use this as the, the foundation for analyses to look for potential moderators of those associations, because those really identify other modifiable risk factors that could be leveraged to reduce that impact of, of um, dementia. Sorry. Yes. I have a question for Dr. Bishop as well. So uh, my question is the combination of chronic condition that you used model in your uh, analysis. So are those a priority or you use some sort of factor analysis or factor loading to determine that what specific combination that you are going to assess to see the cognitive decline if you could comment on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so these were um, really identified, I guess you'd say a priori, because it was, it was not the probabilistic identification of where an individual falls within the identified different subgroups. It was actually very deterministic of, you know, what percent of individuals fall within this specific combination. So it was just a, a, like a, a SQL code that, that identified all possible combinations of the dichotomous indicators of uh, uh, the different diseases and identified what percent of individuals fell within each of those combinations. So basically, the prevalence of each individual combination, each individual condition in the data, and then to look at the SQL code and to determine that those combination. Right, right. It, it wasn't like a like a latent class analysis, you know. And I think that that's another really interesting approach, um, especially taking it to to that limitation of looking at change over time using some kind of latent transition analysis or repeated measures latent class analysis. This could be really informative. Thank you. Okay. And, um, my question is for uh, Dr. Doppelhammer. Um, as you mentioned, there are at least about 10 studies showing that dementia incidence rates have been declining. And some studies have projected that if this continues over the next 15 years, there'll be 60 million fewer cases of dementia that projected. So I have two questions. Um, how do we confirm what the potential causal mechanism is? And the second is, do we know this decline is happening across all racial groups somewhat evenly? Okay, so the first question, um, the first question, if it's really, the, yeah, the causal pathways that lead to the decline. No, and so people are really not very sure about it, but education is always cited as one of the major um, pathway that it works through. Um, uh, if it's education, uh, then it probably could be what we say it's a cohort effect, uh, so that uh, there might be a sort of ceiling effect then, no? because education can go up to a certain level and then uh, everybody has a high education. I mean, this will take some time before everybody has a high education. Uh, but uh, yeah, this to my knowledge, this is the most important pathway it's that's uh, uh, cited, that's uh, explored. Um, yeah, we'll see in the future if that's true or not, I'd say. And when we look at races, uh, so I'm um, so with uh, in. I'm a European, so and in general we we don't do we don't have data on uh, races, but we have 
on race, but we have uh, minority groups. And then you can really see that, um, so this is not over all minority groups. You can't, you, you might not find it in all populations. And uh, as far as I know, you also don't see it in all educational groups. So um, I, yeah, so there are some groups that uh, profit more from this uh, decline in the incidence than others. I hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Dr. Ian. Well, quick, quick question to uh, Dr. Bishop. How, how might your, what are your speculations on how your analysis and results would differ at all among Mexican Americans? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. So some of the work that I'm currently doing is looking at um, differences in multimorbidity burden um, across Mexican older adults in the MHAS and Mexican-American older adults using the health and <laughs> study, and specifically looking at immigration status as a difference. And what we're finding there is that, that U.S.-born Mexican-Americans are particularly at risk of multimorbidity. Um, <clears throat> there's not evidence of um, like a selective return migration, which would, in terms of some, some immigrant health paradoxes, it kind of speaks to that. But I think in terms of cognition, it's probably similar that one, um, US born Mexican Americans likely have greater risk of dementia than immigrant Mexican Americans and probably all Mexican older adults. Now the associations between different multimorbidity combinations and these trajectories, um, I, I don't know. I think diabetes is probably particularly important in Mexico. Um, what would happen in the United States? I don't know. Uh, you know, I think that that's a great um, kind of suggestion for future research. And the one issue is harmonizing cognition in the HRS and the MHOS is, pre is pretty difficult because they don't ask, they don't use the same um, um, cognitive indices there. So it's, there's very few measures that you can actually harmonize in terms of cognition across those studies. So somewhat limited. Next, next steps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, one last question. Yeah. yeah, so speaking of cognition and education, um, do I understand, I'm going to pile on on Dr. Bishop since his topic was so interesting. Um, the elephant in the room here is the diagnosis. And our last um, presenter articulated that getting diagnoses from medical records is problematic. So in terms of diagnosis, you're measuring cognitive impairment, if I understand, with uh, subjects that had 4.2 years of education. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the cognitive uh, paradigm that you use is very intensively dependent on education, right? Memorization of words, uh, verbal fluency, you have to have a good vocabulary, good right, ability to access that information. So then the question is, <clears throat> can you speak to the validity of your measurements of cognition when you're dealing with a population of such a low education that isn't practiced, isn't engaged probably in jobs or have to memorize things. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, so our, our the standardized cognitive index that we've developed has actually not been published before. And, and we developed this because it really served to allow us to look at cognitive change over time. And that is the strength of the measure that we're using, but the major weakness is that, that it hasn't been validated in terms of dementia diagnoses. The MHOS has published um, standardized or, or validated thresholds for dementia diagnoses using that the cross-cultural cognitive examination. So I think in, in, in using that indicator uh, of dementia incidence or onset, I would say that that is that's validated in the population of Mexican older adults. So in as valid as it can be given those limitations regarding education and literacy, I do think that that's probably a trustworthy indicator uh, of um, what would I want to say the the effect of dementia on the individual or the actual symptoms of dementia, identifying dementia from those tests, I do think that that's probably valid. Is it as valid as the, um, the indices in the health and retirement study that are validated on, on our population? I don't know. And then, you know, I think that that's a really good question. 
Um, I don't, it would be difficult to test, for sure, but um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, final time for the set from Eagle. Oh. Nick, and can you design your latent trajectory system to say something about diffidence between rate between black and white, which, for example, which uh, multiplicity combination is responsible for diffidence, not for rate, but for diffidence between rates? For disparities. Sure, sure. You know, so that's um, that that forest plot. And if I'm understanding your correction, the forest plot was actually the um, identification of differences by these combinations um, at baseline. So actually looking at the um, differences in initial cognitive function. So looking at these differences and then the trajectories tell us how the combinations um, differ in cognitive function over time. Um, so that latent growth model, I think, would address that issue. Um, you know, specifically to race and ethnicity in, in this data set, um, there's no variation in race and ethnicity, and it's not something that's measured. But if we were using the health and retirement study, I think you would want to regress the latent intercept on these indicators of race and ethnicity, and that would allow you to identify these baseline differences in cognitive function um, by race and ethnicity. Is that is it sufficient to say which multiplicity combination is responsible for disparity? To the extent that the covariates remove these alternative explanations, I think so. Um, there's another way to the original specification of these latent growth models uh -huh. is to actually use years as the x-axis for time. And in that case, if you if you use that specification of time, you could see the disparity in baseline cognitive function by the different multimorbidity combinations adjusted for age and other covariates. So I think that that would get at the disparity, um, though I do always try to emphasize that we're only adjusting for measured covariates and there's a lot of residual confounding in these models. So there might be something that's not being measured that, you know, really throws a wrench at those things. Okay, thank you. All right. Then thank our speakers again.